It's Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. I'm Rem. I'm Sky. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, I talk a bit about my trip to India. Let's do this. So, you know, we're always kind of hard up, more of a Tuesday thing, to play hardcore board games. Like... It's funny because I remember there was a time when we'd complain about the people who complained about that because we could always just get a game going. But uh, it's surprisingly more difficult just with doing more stuff. So we have our own like private board game night, independent of all these other like board game things we do in the city. And even then, it's still hard to get real games. Because basically, one person shows up every other week. But, or uh, too many people show up. And then, you, too, you know, the thing with hardcore games is that to play, it, it's weird. It's like... Most people have the problem of they have no friends, <laughs> at least most nerds, or they have very few friends. So if they want to play anything for reals, it's very difficult. They can't even get a Mario Party yep, going Even if on. they have a lot of friends, the friends are not uh, in the same physical location. Right. So, you know, to even have anyone is already lucky. But it's like, to, in order to, you know, certain activities require very specific circumstances. To play a hardcore board game, a German game, usually, you need exactly... Three, four, five people, usually four or five, right? Four is mostly the optimal number. And you need need to be in the same place. You need to have like two or three hours of time set aside specifically for this without distractions. And you all need to be dedicated and saying, yes, this is what we're going to do. But so our board game night, you know, we tried to make the hardcore, like semi private, like we, like it's like the high class club, like, oh, you, sir, are a distinguished board gamer. We will invite you to our private fancy board game party. <laughs> but uh, all the people we invite are just as busy with stuff as we are. It's like, oh, I can't come. I'm going to the night market. Yeah. Which is actually pretty cool. But anyway. Or they show up and they just want to play like Spot It and Dixit and they don't want to play for serious. So we tried the Geek Night strategy, also known as the Penny Arcade strategy. If we scheduled our private board game night every other week... And we held it no matter what. And sometimes me and Scott would sit here, the two of us, <laughs> playing games. Usually Chase would come. We'd have three. But uh, for whatever reason, last night was like the night. We had the exact right number of people to play two simultaneous sets of games. Well, even still, we only the hardcore game only half finished. <laughs> But uh, it's a great game, by the way. Yeah, Brass looks uh, pretty good. It's pretty great. And uh, the other game was not hardcore. It's Dixit. Yeah, we played some Dixit, and we played uh, Cameltron. Cameltron's somewhat hardcore. The That's thing respectable. Is, you know, we had, the board game night also had a large social element because it had been a while since we had a lot of people together because everyone's been busy. Indeed, but it's going to be packs real soon. Oh, my God. Basically. I, I'm, I've been basically practicing. You know, most people, they're going to do something. Like, they're going to be in the Olympics. So they train. I play Carcassonne four times a day. I was playing Teeny twice a day. I'm playing Medici once or twice a day. I'm I'm basically pumping board game iron to prepare for packs. And you notice I was winning at Bonanza, right? I was doing, uh, I'm pretty much doing excellent all across the board. So at packs, I am keeping hard score on everything. I might even make a little app or something. That's bullshit. Will you? Will you? I'm going to use a notepad and keep track of all the scores. Will you? Will you? I will. I will you. I'll use a pencil and a paper and a camera to take to to remember all the winnings and losings of bags. Should we do it like MAGFest where we tweet at each victory? We're going to do even harder core than MAGFest. Ah. And I'm going to win. Are you? I've pumped the most board game iron. Uh, It's not just board games. (laughs) That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, actually... But I've also been playing Punch-Out. The trouble is, PAX is the one gaming con where I basically do no video gaming. I do a tiny bit. I'll walk into, like, the old the retro table, or the retro, uh, like, uh, consoles and play, like, a game of Punch-Out or something, like, for five minutes, but... I want to I wanna see if they set up the Bomberman High 10. I mean, PAX, I love it, but the one thing it lacks is an actual arcade. MAGFest is where I go to play video fucking games. It technically has games. one, but it's really small. I know, like, I made that montage video to pump people up for PAX, and it shows that arcade makes it look really badass. The secret is that in the MAGFest video, I showed maybe a quarter of the arcade. Yeah. Because there was so much arcade. That two-second shot from my PAX video is the entire PAX arcade. Yeah. You could fit one to like at least 10 or 20 or 30. Dude, PAX the PAX arcade would in fit in my Fest. apartment. Yeah, it would. In the Geek Night studio, you could fit a good chunk of the PAX arcade. Probably, yeah. Why don't I do that? You're going to have to remove all your stuff. Yeah, and replace it with air hockey. Oh my god, air hockey. Mm-hmm. I would if there were a time when somehow air hockey were the Omegathon finale. <laughs> 
I might just have to rush the stage naked, challenging everyone. Do it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, it's, it's all you. But imagine if we had an air hockey table. All that time we spend, like, laying around going, yep, yep. Instead, it would be click, 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 until we were gods. I think I would finally master the two-finger, which I'm worried about breaking my goddamn wrist when I, I try to play I would watch so way. many YouTube videos and study every single aspect and all the minor, you know, like... Everything. You know what we gotta find? Let's try to find a bar in the city that has like a real air hockey table. All right, New York City air Photon hockey. Photon air hockey. I None know. of that uh, non regulation shit. Air hockey, New York. Let's see. A point friendly to the air hockey table. No. I mean, there's a there. There's not one. There are multiple high class bar lounges dedicated solely to table tennis. Well, hold on. There's one for table tennis. No, right? there's more than one. There really, there's more than just spin. Yeah, there's more than spin. There, I go to spin because spin is the highest class one. They have servants who will walk around handing you balls. All right, so there's Bullmore, which is bowling. Yep. Right there is Bullmore's overrated. There's better places. I know, but I'm just saying that there's. It's a high. It's a relatively fancy bowling bar. It's like spin. Right. There's the place in Brooklyn, which is the skee ball place. Oh yeah. They have leagues. Uh, this barcade, obviously, right? But there is not an air hockey bar. If we had enough money to open a bar and get a liquor license, we could open up the air hockey bar, and we'd probably make just as much money as the skee ball bar does. Easily. Perhaps more. Oh my god. They gosh. just let people play free ski ball and they make all their money by selling alcohol and then they have leagues which bring in a whole bunch of people. You know what I'll do, Scott? I'm gonna ask Steve Magfest. Because I mean we got Katsukan to get us that goddamn rampart machine. Yeah, we gotta pester Magfest. I'm gonna like, go to look. Magfest be like, look, if you get a rampart machine And an air hockey table. Or an air hockey table. And or either one of those, I will promise them that magic will happen around that table. Meaning I will play it must it the be, entire The thing time. is, it has to be a real table. It has to be balanced evenly. It has to work, and it has to, yeah. you know, yeah. it can't be like damaged goods. I'm worried, though. The reason I, I, I almost don't want a Rampart machine to appear is that I've maintained my undefeatedness. It's it's like the only area I have left where I am undefucking feated. Sure. If we actually have access to another Rampart machine, I work like the whole that whole Katsukan where we had it. I was so afraid I was gonna lose, and one game I almost lost. Well, you didn't. You you sort of avoided any game you might have lost. Well, no, the one game I almost lost, but Scott Johnson was pretty drunk, and he basically threw the game in my favor by accident. But there was this really good guy who almost beat me. I was so like, I but was, it's like you know, if we played it, it would, me and Scott Johnson would just walk up to it and be like, "All right, listen, Rim's bragging about it being undefeated. Team up on Rim, okay? Do 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 do. We win." Uh, you see, you say that, but when we play games, usually what happens is you say that, and everyone and everyone kind of looks at you, and I'm like, Scott's just saying that to try to win himself. Well, you know that I would definitely not, I would definitely apple it up. I Scott. would not orange. And if Scott Johnson oranged, which he may well do. I give it a 50-50 shot. I do also. I would go and just get, like, Pete or someone who would not call orange. Do you think Pete wouldn't orange on There's you? There's gotta be, who would Pete not orange? Pete would orange all over you. There has to be someone who would not Pete orange. Pete would get his orange all over your business. Who would go all out and attack only Rim until he was dead to make sure that because he was Scott, no longer even undefeated when you, at Rampart? It's one thing, like last night, right? We had the board game night. I'll just pay some stranger. I'll be like, I'll give you five bucks. All you got to do is only attack that guy. And then once he's dead, we'll play you and me fair and square. I'll go to the guy and be like, 10 bucks. 20. 30. 50. 100. 200. Scott. I have more money than you, and this is this is one area that means a lot to me. Well, because, you know what? I would employ the secret technique, which I will not reveal. Uh, punch me in the face, hack the machine. Something along those lines. Like, <laughs> put my hand over and spin your trackball around while you're Scott's trying to play pieces. Scott's fastest ramparting strategy. <laughs> hit your start button, hit your buttons a whole bunch to play pieces. <laughs> <laughs> So last night, right? You know, this is why drop my fist on your hand and smash it against. Scott, the, the there's a machine. reason you're never able to pull the everybody fuck rim off, and yet I am always able to pull it off on you. People are dicks. Not enough people will listen to this episode from Tuesday to know that I said this, but look at last night, right? Our friend Cat was playing the Cameltron with all our other friends, and not, they all learned the game, and they're playing, you know, as derpily as first time players can play. But Cat had to go outside, so she couldn't finish the game. So I took over for her, and I sit down. And I look, and she's actually in a really good position. So I immediately sit down and say, oh, all right, I got to figure out, if, oh, my God, what was Cat doing? Oh, my God, I can't win. Look at this. Look at that camel doesn't have anything. Uh, and I bitched about it for, like, 10 turns. Meanwhile, I was winning by, like, 30 points. And yeah. no one noticed because I was bitching so much. Yeah, you know what happened to me? We started playing brass, right? And I'd never played this game before, and I wasn't quite sure what the strategies were or anything. So, uh, you know, I make a move. I'm just sort of fooling around. I'm like, I'll build a coal mine, whatever. I'm just fe feeling it out, just trying stuff. Whatevs. And then I realize, oh, 
You should, and I say it out loud, you should sell cotton immediately to up your income. Otherwise, you're stuck at zero. I heard you say it. Then Steve is like, oh, and he he, bring in, <laughs> he sells cotton immediately, thus making it harder for anyone else to do it. He gets a big boost in income before anyone else. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I was the one who thought of that. <laughs> Because, Scott, the but now I lose. The way to win the packs who wins the most game games is to pull out games that no one's played before and just captain it up. Craft I've, captain, craft captain, the thing craft is, captain. I don't feel bad. I feel bad. Bushels doing that. in the castle, wanna, biscuits in the baskets. I want to win legitimately. I want to play games everyone knows how to play and outpower everyone. Because that is much more satisfying. All right, games everyone knows how to play. Teeny, we're deadlocked. Puerto Rico, we're deadlocked. Like, if I win a Bonanza, that's a big fucking uh, deal. A Bonanza, Roe's going to kick the shit out of both of us. We could, that's what I'm just saying. If I, that's the, the point. It's like a game people, everyone's good at. If, I, if you win a Dominion, it's like, boom! <laughs> yes! If she ain't wins the Dominion, it's like, saw that coming. <laughs> That's a different <difference. laughs> Right? It's like, you got to win at a game that people know, and then it's like, yeah, that counts. What? You know? What? Otherwise, yeah. it's like, if you're Michael Jordan walking out playing against the high school kids, it's like, it doesn't mean anything. Or if you're the high school kid walking out playing against Michael Jordan, it doesn't mean anything, right? For it to be a real championship, it's got to be the best of the best playing for serious. So, a little bit of news. You know, it's Thursday. It's the lounge. You <laughs> and your lounge. Talk about whatever we want. You know so, what's in my lounge? Air hockey table. <laughs> there was a pretty good article in The Atlantic, actually, and I want to call attention to it. I want to talk about it a lot, but uh, it argues that The Daily Show, of all shows, you know, people always say The Daily Show, you know, provides more news to people than it should. Be, you know, people watch it to get the news, even though it's a comedy show. Mm. Uh, it is interesting how, like, vaguely obsessed Fox News is with The Daily Show when The Daily Show is ostensibly comedy and Fox News is ostensibly news. But I digress. That's This isn't new news for any of you. It's old news. We're talking about news. Century-old news. So this article takes it from a different light. It, it talks about the whole UNESCO fiasco. Are you familiar with this, Scott? Not really. Okay, so here's the deal. This is old news. Yeah, I might know it once you start talking about it. I followed it because I was really pissed off about it, but uh, the media basically didn't care. So UNESCO is the UN organization that basically tries to provide like clean water to people in starving countries. All right. And well, education. They didn't seem to be doing a very good job in India. Uh, they focus on the places that are worse off than India. Okay, where they can't but even get the bottled water. They also work in India. They're, they're, they're basically... It's an organization to where no one can say anything bad about them. All right. They are nothing but a force for good. All they do is give water to people who have no water. So the, the members of UNESCO voted to allow Palestine in. Of course. So Do they need water? Uh, yeah, no. Are not, they people? No, they provide aid to people who aren't even in. If you're in, it means you're helping with humanitarian efforts. You have a vote in UNESCO to where the money goes, stuff like that. Oh, okay. So they wanted to bring Palestine in, and there was a huge majority of votes in UNESCO to allow Palestine to join this purely humanitarian organization. If they want to give money to help people, including themselves and others, and then, you know, have a small one vote in deciding who gets help, what's wrong with that? So, I humans. believe 12 or 13 members of UNESCO voted against this. All the Jews? Uh, pretty much Israel, the U.S., and all the Israel-allied countries. Right, okay. So, the U.S. pulled all funding from UNESCO. What the fuck? Seventy Obama million was, dollars. Obama gone. was like just okay with that. Obama's actually really pissed about it. Oh, okay. Oh. But he can't do anything. It's Congress. So Congress oh, right. passed a law. So you, okay. Long time ago, '90s, saying any UN organization that recognizes Palestine as a state. We will not talk to them. We will not help them. We will deny all funding. We'll basically fuck them. Dude, some this is like an uh, this is the thing is right. If you think about this like a board game, what they should do the all these people in the UN should just be like, hey, let's fuck the U.S. Let's put Palestine in every organization, forcing the U.S. out of everything. Uh, Scott, uh, the Republicans and a lot of people in the U.S. would love that because basically all it means is the U.S. stops funding humanitarian programs well, around no, the world. Well, no, they could do it in all of the other things that the U.S. wants to be on. Like the U.N. could vote Palestine onto the Security Council, right, which would be crazy, and then just like, oh, U.S. can't be on the Security Council anymore. Oh, China so makes all decisions. It's a little more complicated than that, but I anyway. Just, you know, I'm just saying, crazy shit. So the law mm -hmm. is there ostensibly to force Israel and Palestine to negotiate directly and to not let anyone else influence that in any way. Of course. Now, the reasoning behind that and, like, this whole situation is basically absurd. Duh. So, and this article talks about how all the news coverage of it basically 
toed, not the party line, but the kind of status quo line. Like the, the news all said, yep, well, they reported very matter of fact, like, you know, this organization voted to let Palestine in. The U.S. has a law that says that they can't fund it. So the U.S. had to stop funding it at the end. So the, the Daily Show did, like, a double feature on how bullshit this is. Of course. It's like, this is one of those things where it's like, oh, there's a rule that the U.S. can't do it. It's like, uh, a rule is just something that's made up by people. Uh, no, you can just Scott, fucking change it's that more than, shit. It's a rule made up by Congress that they can trivially change. Right, so, you can so just change that shit. John Oliver it's not like the law of thermodynamics you can't change. John Oliver on The Daily Show interviewed a senator and was like, so we can't do anything about this. The guy's like, yeah, our hands are tied. We can't fund them. And he was like, because of the law you passed. He's like, that's right. It's like, so Congress doesn't have the power to change laws. That's good to know. <laughs> and the guy's like, well, uh, basically he punked him. Yes. So this article, you know, not to get into the UNESCO thing, even though it's absurd, but the article points out that The Daily Show, scarily, is actually the only major news show in the world, or at least in America, even though it's not a news show that when it covers the news, does not cover it from the status quo perspective, but covers it from a actually a more objective standpoint than actual news does, because actual news and trying to be objective doesn't actually talk about the ramifications of anything and really just focuses on the facts and assumes a lot of these things that are status quo when really the news story isn't that the U.S. had to follow this law. The news story is that this is a fucked up situation that's hurting people. Dope. And it's actually a really great article. And but the, that's why The Daily Show is comedy, right? Comedy is truth. Have you read friggin' Stranger in a Strange Land or not? Uh, or perhaps <laughs> uh, the court jester is the only one who can call the king fat. No kidding, right? <laughs> Except we live in a place where there's free speech. The news could call the king fat, and the king can't do shit about it. The news just doesn't. Why don't we just start a news where we say that we have the same smart perspective, but we don't present it as comedy? And we just put it on YouTube every day. We'll do one news story. Let's put that in the hopper with the other thousand the other things thousand in the hopper. Things. Why right is after... someone listening to the show? Just do it. We don't care how shitty it is. It could be like elementary school Let's see. CCTV news quality. We it have doesn't Project matter. Scott. We have Project ST, Project CRL. They're all Project ST. <laughs> We have Project But PTI. anyone out there who's got a camera, just sit in front of it every day, pick a news story, and just be like, today, you know, UNESCO, whatever, funding cut, because of this rule, the government is stupid and they could just change it, but they refuse to. In other words, all your congressmen are basically taking, you know, clean water out of the mouths of starving people. They're disgusting. End of story. So this is an interesting article. I highly recommend mm. you read it. Great. Uh, so you have anything? Oh, I did. I remember my news now. I didn't have a I didn't have a link open for it, so I couldn't remember what it was. So check this out. There's this crazy dude, and he went to a casino. Now, usually going to a casino is not a good idea, right? It's a way to lose all the monies because casinos, the house always wins, always. And he, you know, there was card counting at one point, but today card counting doesn't work, right? Forget it. But this guy, he was you know big time gambler, and apparently I wasn't totally aware of this, but if you're a big time gambler. You don't just walk into a casino and play. You talk to the casino, and because you have so much money, they talk to you. So, like, if, if you and me walk into a casino, you know, you walk over to the craps table, and it says, like, 5X. You can't change that. That's just the rule for the game. And if you don't like the rule, you don't play there. If you're mad rich, you can walk in and be like, hey, can you set me up a craps table with these rules? And they'll be like, well, actually, we don't like those rules because then the house doesn't always win. How about these rules? And you can negotiate on the rules and, like, how much money you're going to spend and all this stuff. So this guy went in, and he negotiated with these casinos. And, by the way, the casinos are the desperate. Like, actually, Foxwoods is even in big trouble because, you know, there's basically this more casinos. The love's getting spread around. There's online poker and stuff, right? So casinos are not doing well lately. So they're basically more desperate than ever to, to get people to come in, especially the high rollers. Because, you know, a whole bunch of low rollers, you know, a bus full of people coming from the city isn't going to Well, help. it's old ladies nickel at a time. Right. You, and if you want to, you know, but one high roller, if he comes in and loses all his monies... Your casino's good for like a whole month or two. So you're, it's like, yeah, we need that. So they're desperate to get this guy in the door. So, you know, the guy's figuring out which casino he wants to go to. So they're sort of competing as who's going to set in more favorable rules to get him in the door. They also actually are not technologically stupid. They actually have this computerized system that works and is good where they can type in the rules. Like, guy wants to play blackjack. 
with six decks and it wants to allow double splitting and wants to allow this and that rules for this minimum bet on this and this. And then it'll pretty much tell the casino owner, you know, once he types in those rules, thumbs up, we'll win, or thumbs down. No, this is a bad idea if we let him play this game, right? So apparently whoever was at this casino totally fucked up and didn't use the software properly or who <laughs> knows what. And they basically let this guy play at what was almost like 50-50 odds on blackjack. So he walked in with like, he's mad rich. So he was just like million dollars and he got mad lucky and he got like four eights and he split it four ways. And there was also some weird rule about like, you know, usually in blackjack, it's like the, the, the house like has to hit in a certain situation and has to stop in a certain situation. And it's usually the same rules all the time. Yep. Those rules were even different in this game. So it was basically a situation where like he had four hands and the house went over and it was like, oh, one hand with millions of dollars. Ah, ha, 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 ha. And this guy just It's rolled, a pretty good story. The dude freaking rolled the casino without cheating, right? Without cheating. He didn't count the cards. He was, just played blackjack smartly and normally and had the rules of the game changed, but the casino agreed to it. So uh, this is just another one. I wanted to bring this up, though, because it's, not, you know, it's an example of smart nerdiness, a guy knowing the rules, doing the math, using his smart brain to get ahead, right, which is, which is laudable. But it's also a, uh, another example of if you want to get more rich and you already are rich, it's real easy, right? But if you're poor, you can't get more rich as easily as someone who's already rich. Even at the casino. But anyway, things of the day. So I was born in 1982. Me too. And this video is from 1982. Me too. It is a video, volume one, of How to Beat Home Video Games. I wonder how much that shit cost on VHS, like 30 bucks per... I have no idea, but and this it's is... It probably cost like 30 bucks for one VHS tape, and... It probably was like fifty dollars for the Atari games. You're this paying is thirty how bucks to, beat, to learn how to beat how to beat Atari Circus, and there's something with the about the one with the seesaw. Yes. Yeah, I know how to beat it. Always make sure the seesaw is under the falling dude. <laughs> he has some good strategies here, but the thing is, it's it's interesting to watch because it's a blast from the past, and it reminds me that I didn't own Circus Atari, but I had this. Catalog I borrowed it for a short time when I was a kid. That listed like every Atari game you could buy in like a review of it, and I was obsessed with all the games I didn't have. Of course. Uh, Circus Star is actually not that good of a game. It's not the worst, though. It's not the best. There are a lot worse Atari games, but it is not exactly one of the Atari greats like Pitfall and such. Yeah, but these strategies, I don't know, these videos are pretty interesting to watch, and they really take you back yeah. to, you know, the early 80s were more like the late 70s than you might realize. I have a VHS tape because when the TurboGrafx-16 was coming out, they had a big promotional thing at the mall, at the shopping mall next to us, and I went over there and we played a bunch of demo stations before, like, you could even buy one. Ah. And uh, I got a VHS tape that has is basically an advertisement for TurboGrafx-16, and I must have watched it, like, two or three times. Go I on. have the VHS tape. It's not that old. Of, uh, I should dig it up and try to get it onto YouTube cause if it's not on there already. Dragon Strike, that D&D-ish uh, game that was released with the VHS tape that came with it. Never played it, but I, I knew about it. Yeah, I had it. I had the VHS tape. Whoa. Never played it, though, because no one would play it with me. I was a bigger fan of the one. I can't seem to find it anywhere, but it came. Remember the second end? I know which one you're talking about. The second level was a haunted house. No. Or haunted mansion. No. No? I'm talking about this D&D game where it was basically, you had no GM because there was a big box full of cards that was the GM, right? And, like, the box was basically, remember the, the style, when they reprinted the second edition stuff, it was in a different graphical style where it was black, and right, with the, you know, the picture in the middle? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, yeah. And basically this box was in that style and had a big red dragon on it. And it, basically you had a fold-out dungeon and you would move your guys around the dungeon sort of like Hero Quest, but it was, D &D, it was TSR D&D &D brand. And it had a, you know, there was this big box full of cards and basically you would move around and then instead of, you know, being a GM or anything, you just went to the box and it told you what was in the dungeon and stuff. Oh, so I found your video. There were multiple versions of this, apparently. That's the one. I got it. I'll link to it. Bonus thing of the day. All right. So anyway, my actual thing of the day. Yep. Is, uh... Everyone's probably seen this already because it was all over the internet, and I'm pretty sure there's a whole probably a whole bunch of things like this, so it's not unique at all. Um, 
And it's, you know, but whatever. It's got 4 million views. It could use a few more views. It's something called the Wrecking Crew Orchestra. And this is actually pretty recent from February 8th, 2012. So even if these guys have been around a while, this is a recent performance. What they do is they're basically a dance troupe, but they perform in the dark and they wear suits covered it with lights. And, you know, like strip lights and LED lights. Now, think and, about the ramifications of what you can do with that. And, yeah, and the lights are basically pre-programmed or controlled by someone from a central location or something. So they dance and they appear and disappear and shift and they do all sorts of cool, you know, performance tricks going on here. Uh, and it is fun to watch. I mean, it wouldn't probably be fun to watch, like, you know, a whole bunch of these. But watching one, if you haven't seen one, is really awesome. And if you've seen it already, all right. If you haven't seen it already... Must see. So in the meta moment, uh, two weeks to PAX. Yeah. It's a coming. We're doing a whole bunch of panels, and a bunch of our friends are doing a whole bunch of panels and workshops, and playing a whole bunch of games. We're do We're gonna be at PAX in force. Pretty much, we're. I gotta apologize. PAX fever is in full effect as it is twice a year. Maybe it'll become three times a year. We have no idea. Well, there's a cure. If you are PAX. so hyped about PAX that you can't get over it, I'll link to a video. I made a montage of how awesome PAX was PAX That's East last year. And if you watch it, it might excite you so much you'll die, and then you won't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> just say, yeah. It's, like, it's not going to help. It's only I know. I was That's like, hmm, cure for AIDS? Well, like last Unprotected night. Unprotected sex with someone with AIDS. Last night during the uh, board cure game night. Cure for flu? We were talking about ponies, and I was like, oh, there was a bunch of ponies at PAX. Yeah, now, like going like, outside in the cold naked, that's a cure for flu. They were like, what? I'm like, yeah, so I pull up that montage video, and I skip to where all the pony stuff was, and then I'm like, oh, shit, PAX. Oh, shit, PAX. Uh-huh. Uh, you want to make predictions now as to what the Omegathon is going to be, or save it for Tuesday? I'm gonna, I'm sti- I told you, I'm sticking with, because they, they already said- It's East, they so had- it's going to be teams- most it's, likely. It's East, so it's co-op, guaranteed. And, you know, they had to have something built. I'm going this. with Double Dare. It can't be Double Dare. Why I'm, not? It could be the Double Dare uh, challenge no. at the end. I am thinking... Agro Craig? No. I'm still going with my Rock'em Sock'em robot until, you know, it is no more. Scott, right? you know what would be the ultimate, I realize. As I'm much not, as I want, you know, the Double Dare, the Agro Craig... Crossfire. Cross, crossfire. Crossfire! You got it in the Crossfire! crossfire. But that's not co-op either. But they, uh, the but they ultimate, could easily ultimate, ultimate make any of these things co-op. Would be if it was straight up American Gladiator. <laughs> they did make an aggro crag. It's guts. Yeah. They have all full guts built in the thing. The thing is, depending on the nerds who get How to the How could they finale, possibly keep it secret? It might be guts. <laughs> <laughs> and the book club book is The Hunger Games because it seems to be spreading faster than Twilight on Cancer. And it's pretty good, actually. Not great, but pretty good. I liked it. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll do a show on it whenever. Yet. I haven't read it yet, but I have a copy. And, yeah. But people say that it's basically Battle Royale, the ripoff, plus some Arnold Schwarzenegger running man. Mixed and some in 1984. There. Yeah. So that's what people it's say good. about it. So maybe that maybe that sounds good to you. I don't know. But that's what people say. Uh, it exceeded expectations by a by a surprising amount. I'll, it'll probably actually be a soon book club because once I actually start reading it, it shouldn't take very long at Dude, all. Dude, it's like a two and a half hour read. Right. So as soon as I actually get around to it, it'll be like bam, and we'll do this book club right away and get a new one going. It'll be much less weight than the previous book club, which took a while. Kineticon is coming up. We run the panels and workshops department. Uh, if you submit a panel, I will link to the form, and you're a Geek Nights listener. There's a good chance you'll get one because you guys give us some of the best panels we get normally. Nepotism. <laughs> but yeah, submit your panels. It's not nepotism. They're not in our family. Uh, they're, uh, they're an extended family. The Geek Knights family. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we got an internet. We got a YouTube channel. Got a website. Got a forum. All that stuff. It's all there. So it might be kind of a cop out, but I figure I'd just talk about you know my experiences in India because I'd never been to India before. All right, do you want to get any sort of uh, prejudiced racist out of our system now? Like, oh, Dalsim, great tiger. Oh, so basically, Hello, when I was there, I'm a poop. Thank you. Come again. Everybody breathed fire. In I'm fact, sorry, if you get everyone food from India. For, if you got food from a street vendor, he breathed fire on it before he gave it to yeah. you. I'm sorry, everyone from India. I'm sure that when you can do a show about your trip to America, make fun of us, please, because I want to hear that. Actually, the best joke someone made. And it was actually an Indian guy that I was hanging out with while I was there. Right. Was like, where are all the Native Americans? I heard there are many of them here. <laughs> he, he was a funny guy. Yeah. 
<laughs> he was one of my cab drivers. <laughs> he tried to do too much with it. He was the same one who was like, he was he was really proud of the slum. Like, in kind of how, like, in America, like, if you're showing someone around New York, you'll be like, yeah, that's a New York bum. Check him out. Or that's, see how there's no one in that subway car? Yeah. <laughs> it smells like, was like That's our slum. There's at least two million people in there. Yeah. It's pretty big. And he's like, you want to take a picture? Like, he was really just like, check it out. But anyway, I, I was there on business, so I actually didn't get to do, like, I kind of, I had evenings and a couple of times to myself where I could, like, wander around, but I was actually mostly beholden to a whole bunch of kind of corporate-style meetings, and I had to go to this conference there, like a convention, and deal with, uh, you know, booths and stuff. But uh, it was the first time I traveled extensively on uh, corporate money as opposed to my own money, and that's a very interesting experience. It's the opposite of, like, we go to a convention and like, $10 hot dog. You're like, are you crazy? Now it's like, $10 hot dog. Who gives a shit? It's not my money. <laughs> I want a hot dog, and I don't want to walk anywhere. Give me. Even better, what's interesting is that when you're in this position, you're kind of obligated to take other businessmen out to eat and stuff like that. So you basically, it's expected that you're going to spend a ton of money on like room service and cocktails and all that kind of crazy stuff. But uh, I'll try to skip the businessy stuff, but uh, I flew to Mumbai. Uh, you may know it as Bombay. Now what's interesting is it's Mumbai. That's the official name of the city. That's kind of like what you're expected to say. That's what's written on all the things. And I'd gotten the impression that everyone called it Mumbai. No, they but, say Bombay. So when I got there, the only people who said Mumbai were foreigners and rich people. Yep. And everyone else that I met called it Bombay. Yep. I've heard that already. Yep. But what's really funny is we got to meet some executives from the uh, Bombay Stock Exchange, the BSE, which they call it the BSE now because they don't want to change the name to the Mumbai Stock Exchange mm. or change the acronym or anything. Because imagine how much of a pain in the ass it would be. Like if you have all these like network things, name something publicly and you have to like rename everything. Like imagine if you had to rename all the variables and class names in your code because of some BS. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the cool thing was. It's called said. Yeah, but that may or may not work well, depending on... <laughs> you got to do it right. Well, one of the worst things in the Grip world first. is when you're trying to fix some code and you find out that the name of a class was actually spelled wrong in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the worst. But I digress. So, you know, we, we, uh, I got to meet like a bunch of people who run the, the Bombay Stock Exchange and we went up to their tower and I realized at the top that it was really the only tall building like in that area of Bombay. And... The guy introduces us, and we realize we can see, like, the entire city out these windows. And I look, and I see all this military stuff. He's like, that's the entire Indian Navy. Don't take any pictures. We'll get in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And apparently, after the Mumbai terrorist attacks, and, you know, India's got some problems, like many places in the world do. So you're not allowed to have tall buildings in that area because you can basically spy on the military. Yeah. And the buildings are targets for attacks, which is actually that a concern remind, there. That reminds me of this dude. He, uh, there was a photo an astronaut posted, and he, it was like, what was the craziest thing you saw from space? And he's like, look at this. And there was like this line on the Earth, and it was this glowing line. And he's like, that's the India-Pakistan border. It's a glowing line. Like you can see it from like you can see it more easily than you can see like the Great Wall of China. Which actually, the you Great can't Wall of really China see. is one of the hardest things to see. It's right. not visible from it's space. Right, but the the you, like you could clearly see this thing. It was like it looked like a, a string of light bulbs that was just ridiculously long, and I was like, whoa. That's for serious, yo. So by law, you can't, you can't really see the, I mean, there's other, you know, contentious borders around the world, but you can't really see them from space like you can see that one. Well, you can see the implicit uh, North Korea, South Korea border. Well, that's different. You can just see that because it's at night because it's dark and then South Korea actually has lights. So they can't have legally tall buildings there, but the government was kind of smart about it. They're like, yeah, we're not going to make you tear down the only already existing tall building. Don't let people take pictures of the Navy. You'll get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But it was a really great view, and I wish I could have taken a picture. It was really... You should have just taken one illicitly and then posted it anonymously on, like, Imgur or something, and then been like, ah! Yeah, I don't want to deal with that, especially because I may or may not be trying to do business with the Bombay Stock Exchange. No, you don't. You just don't post it until the business is done. You obviously wouldn't go home and post it immediately. Then they know it was you. You do it, like, months later when uh, it could have been anyone who visited in any of those months, or even, like, nah, a year later. Nah, because think about it. So I take a picture of the Indian Navy, right? Mm -hmm. Say the picture gets out and there's some bullshit. Some Navy intelligence guy over there is going to look at the picture and be like, all right, these are the ships that were in port. So we know Didn't that he it, say it was the whole Navy? Uh, well, no, that's the Navy port. Like, I'm sure a ship or two were out, you know, doing stuff. Uh, they move them around in the port. Oh, uh, okay. But it was, it was a really impressive view. 
But uh, the funny thing, so I flew Air India, and it was it wasn't a coach here; it was actual Air India. Well, Air India isn't exactly Lufthansa. So uh, the domestic flights within India were way more comfortable than JetBlue, like way nice. That's nice. The, but were, you, were you first class? With no, your God no. Money? Okay, God no. Our company's doing well, well but that's not that the, well. the thing about JetBlue is it's not supposed to be the crazy comfortable. It's supposed to be everything's the same. It's simple. Yeah, it's the cheap, coach on Air India domestic flight was way comfortable. It was right, way more monies too. No. No? It was actually way cheap. Okay. The uh, international flight was literally the most uncomfortable chair that was actually a chair I've ever sat on in my entire <laughs> was it life. Was just like a wooden stick that shoved up your butt? There was this <laughs> bar like shoving its way into my ass through this thin but, ass cushion. Was it a broken chair? Were, I were asked, all the chairs the same? I think they were all the same because the guy next to me was squirming the whole time. And then I look at him, I'm like... Is there a bar? He's like right in my butt. And I was like, okay, it's not just me. <laughs> okay. But uh, I engineered a solution. I asked for like- A pillow and you put it under your ass? They didn't have any extra pillows. So I asked for like eight <laughs> blankets and I manufactured a device of blankets that worked okay. You know what the uh, answer is? If you ever have to go to India, bring First a class. Or a seat cushion. Just bring a seat cushion like the kind they use at football stadiums. Yeah, I try to travel really light and not carry stuff on me. Or you can get the neck pillow and just put it on- under your butt instead. The other important thing about the flight is that uh, I now have ample evidence to say that I do not, in fact, suffer from jet lag and or jet lag is a myth. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy about that. I got there and everyone who flew with me, like all the other people, were wicked jet lagged. And literally, I fly into India. It's evening. I get some dinner. I wander around. I go to bed. I wake up the next morning feeling great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everyone else like couldn't eat and, blah, and, blah, and, blah, and I was fine. It was awesome. I think it's psychological. Uh, no, it actually is a real thing. I don't know. But some people are apparently immune to it. Okay. And I've uh, never had much of a problem with it. At least uh, not a noticeable one. When was the last time you flew more than five time zones? More than five time yeah. uh, Israel? Yeah, so when was that? Uh, 2000. Okay, that 12 was years 12 ago. years ago. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But uh, the only problem that I have when I fly, because the same thing happened in Japan, is every day around 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, I'm so tired. I, like, and in, like the, the second night I was there, I got, home, like, I got out of this conference, go to my room, and I'm like, I'm going to check some internet. And I literally opened my laptop, and I remembered starting to type my password in. And then I woke up the next morning. In the chair, the laptop was still sitting on my lap, and I hadn't finished typing are you my sure? best. Are I'm, you sure that wasn't jet lag? Uh, Scott, it was like 10 o'clock at night, so if that was jet lag, then jet lag's fine, because it meant I went to bed at a reasonable goddamn hour. Uh -huh. And I woke up at like 7 o'clock, which was when I wanted to wake up. Mm -hmm. Jet lag means you're like not hungry, and you're like can't get up in the morning, and you're like way tired all day. And well, all I definitely don't things. have that problem. <laughs> So I, you know, I get to Mumbai and I, I get a driver and he takes me to the uh, to the fancy hotel, and the fancy hotel Mumbai is weird because it's like ultra luxury. Like this, is like shall I warm serves crack pipe fails to describe the opulent care that was taken of me when I showed up at this hotel. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, outside of the hotel were some straight up shanty towns, right. city of God, so it, slums. it's basically Monaco only bigger. Uh, yeah, and more distributed. Mm -hmm. Like, the slums are integrated, and they're not all slums. Some of them are just very, very dense, populated, like, residential areas. Some of them are shanty towns, but then, like, right next to it is, like, ultra-luxury, like, hotel or so, ultra-luxury right. so condos. So, it's, you know, in Monaco, it's pretty much rich stuff in the middle, rich stuff in the water, and then the poor stuff is, like, on the outskirts. Yeah, Mumbai is so dense. This is all intermingled, which is great, you know, yeah. kind of great, because in the U.S., right, we got rich and poor, but they're all super separated. Rich people live in the woods on long roads with gates. And in New York, like, in New York City, there's ultra-rich, and there's the American equivalent of very poor, but... You don't get to the level of the shanty towns in our cities. That the our equivalent no, of that is like Appalachia. Or you live in like one of the you know projects, you know public housing, whatever. So and it's you know, I get the not hotel and a shanty town. Of course, every building that I went into for this entire trip had even like malls and everything had metal detectors and security at every door and like crazy security everywhere. But the security was actually effective. They just made you walk through a metal detector, and they were smart about it. Like every time I walked through, my cell phone and my wallet would beep. And the guy would, like, grab it outside my pocket, and he had this look on his face like, this is a white guy, and it's obviously a cell phone. 
<laughs> he didn't like freak out about the bulge in my pocket. It clearly was not a gun. Yep. But the security was pretty reasonable. Like it, it amazes me how the countries that have actual terrorism have reasonable security. Well, we have actual the, ter- we had actual We had terrorism. actual terrorism over a decade ago. Right. And yet we have security theater that is both more intrusive and less effective than what goes on in like India. Yep. I'm so pissed off about that, but I'm not going to, this isn't a show about me complaining about security in the No, TSA. that's every show. I know. But, uh, so I, you know, I get some dinner and then I decide to wander around Mumbai. So I go to walk out of the hotel. They were aghast. Like, where is sir going? Where is sir's driver? Like they were insistent. Like, where's your driver? Should we get your driver? Should we get your car ready? What, what do you mean you're walking out? Where are you going? And I was like, I'm just going somewhere. I'm walking out. I'll be back. And I, I kind of walked by over all their protests and wandered on did into like, the streets. Did like Google Maps work? Could you find your way back with that? Yeah, so I didn't have data there because of my CDMA phone. But you had your, oh, everything there is GSM. Yes. Yeah. So You couldn't get I did, a temporary phone with your corporate credit card? I didn't bother. All right. I had a temporary phone, but I hadn't hooked it up yet. Like, I hadn't gotten the data plan going. Uh, but it was just a regular phone, or was it a smartphone? It was a smartphone. Oh, okay. So what I did is I turned on Google Tracks, and I started tracking, because GPS works fine. So if I got lost, I could at least see where I started and navigate back to that. Mm. And that actually worked, because I wandered way, way off into Mumbai. I wandered through some of the... But if it was night, how did you, like, not get hit by cars and shit? So, uh... Ah, uh, that was actually a concern. <laughs> no kidding. So you see videos of, like, India, and you see, you know, basically a three-lane road in India is actually a five-lane road plus two motorcycle lanes, you know, sidewalks. And it is amazing. There is literally no such thing as traffic laws there, as far as I can tell. Or at least, if there are traffic laws, no one cares. But... You get this impression watching those videos that it's totally safe and like everyone, because everyone's going so slow and paying so much attention, and that you know it just kind of works. Like yeah, it's like so in amazing. the videos, it's like you see crazy shit, but you also see people. You know, they're slowing down, they're taking their time, they're waiting for the spot, and then they move in. No, and it, thousands die. The roads are death traps. Road deaths are one of the biggest problems in India. So many people die. It is crazy. Mm. So I walk out into the street and I'm on this kind of sidewalk and it's fine, except occasionally shanties were like built into the sidewalks. I have to like get around them. And that's a big problem in India, encroachment. People will like have a building and then one day they put like some corrugated steel like a a foot out from their store. And then they quietly take down the wall inside their building. And then they put the wall back up right at the edge of the steel. And then they move the steel another foot out. Uh-huh. Stuff like that happens all the time. It's Why would you want to make your building longer? Oh, you want more space. Eventually, you make up enough space to have an apartment in there or oh. another store. You give it a whole store in the sidewalk space? Yeah, it's like there are some stores that were literally the size of like a closet. Oh, okay. that's just how it is. It's very, very, very dense. Mm. I mean, India is a, a nation it's like of more than can, a billion people. It's like if you can get a square inch, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's but I wandered market. around through the streets, and the thing is, everyone was like. I was kind of impressed at how friendly everyone is. Why wouldn't they be friendly? Because, you know, in New York, everyone's not friendly. They're kind of, they're trying their well, best. Well, the thing is, right, is it's like when you're packed in with a lot of people, you got to be friendly because not friendly doesn't work when you're so packed in. with Exactly, you know? but I think because you're more packed in, there's like this extra onus to be friendly because you're really like in it together if something goes down. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're, you're, you're basically, you know, it's like you're, when you're on the subway, you know, you're friendly because you're packed in like sardines, right? You're not going to be a jerk on the subway unless you're crazy. But, you know, you can be a jerk when, like, you know, you can go home and be all alone and not have to deal with the people yelling at you for being a jerk. So the way I figured out to walk around is I kind of watched what everyone else did and kind of followed crowds. Like, I didn't walk anywhere that I didn't see someone else walking first. So I was always following someone. Mm. And Good strategy. that probably saved my life because there were straight up death traps. Like, you could walk and without realizing it be in the middle of, like, Train tracks or, like, crazy highway. Oh, not death traps like someone's going to kill you. No, no, death traps like a, a motorcycle's going to hit you because there's a thousand of them and none of them have headlights. Mm. And no one has helmets. Mm. I rode some motorcycles. My coworkers, you know, they took me around town, like, when I was in Hyderabad later. And I just got to ride on the back of motorcycles through this crazy traffic. No one wears helmets. And it was, it actually made me, it reminded me how awesome motorcycles are and I kind of want one again. Well, if we go to India, you know what I'm going to do? First thing at the airport? Get a driver? Buy a helmet. Where? <laughs> I did not see a helmet for sale anywhere. We could bring one. I guess you could. I wouldn't need. To, I wouldn't necessarily bring like a crazy one. Like do So Scott, uh, if you're going to go around India, here's a trick. It costs maybe 20 or 30 bucks to have a driver 
for an entire day who will drive you anywhere you want. But the road is still a death trap. You can get killed and still drive it. No, and if you're in a car, you're basically safe because you're not going to get hit hard. The people who die are the people on motorcycles or in the little tuk-tuks mm. or the fast streams. Mm. But uh, in a car, you're safe. And for like 20 or 30 bucks, a guy will drive you around all day, wait for you anywhere you go, take care of all your, all your like baggage and everything. Man, the cars must be cheap or what? Like, what kind of car is this? Well, because the exchange rate is interesting. It's about a thousand rupees. Like, a thousand rupee note is like a 20. Okay. $20. That's not bad. But the prices, because of this, like, half the country, like, the country is modernizing so quickly, and yet there's this huge, like, mass of population that the disparity between rich and poor and the economies of these different areas are diverging so rapidly that in the five star hotel, I drop the equivalent of like a hundred bucks on dinner, mm-hmm. and then the room service was actually. What do you think was the rooms? What do you think? What do you think? Indian room service. I'm usually so Scott, the, I'm usually the best at room service guessing game, but not when so it's Scott, a foreign country. In a five star hotel designed for foreigners who are rich businessmen at a conference. What do you think? Two eggs over easy and some toast would cost room service delivery. All right, so in the U.S., that's like forty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, right? Now, because I'm not going to... It is a five-star hotel, and it's fancy, so not going to be like $1, right? Yeah. And I'm not going to... It's got to be more expensive than like the diner here, which is like five bucks. It was cheaper than the diner. It's got to be like... Room service was cheaper. It, it's it got to be like seven, eight, no, nine. No, Scott, I used the mini bar in my room because it was cheaper than what I pay for some of those things at a convenience store in the U.S. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. I got. I, I opened it. I, was, I wanted a Red Bull. Like, I really needed some caffeine. They had it there? There was Red Bull in the mini fridge, and I'm like, and I pick it up. I'm like, all right, this is going on the corporate card, but I'll get in trouble if I have a ten dollar Red Bull. Of course. <laughs> and I look at the sheet, and it's like a dollar seventy five. I'm like, what? You should have just asked for a case at that price because they're, so, t- they're two bucks here. I know. <laughs> you should be like, hey, how many Red Bulls can you guys get me? <laughs> but yeah, room service is way cheap. But like outside, like I went to a, a restaurant, like a normal restaurant, to get. Uh, Doza, which is basically like a crepe. It's the one Indian food I've never really seen in the U.S., but it's what everyone needs for breakfast. It's like a crepe. Yeah, was the Indian food there? Like, is our Indian food like the way Chinese food is, where it's not the same, or is it the same stuff? Like, you know, it's actually well in New York, it's actually mostly the same, other than that the meat there was so much more tender. Mm. The land, like well, I, got, I mean, I imagine there's less food regulations and things. Uh, yeah, right? but here's the thing: the the most of the places I ate at, just because of the nature of my travel, were like ultra fancy five star restaurants. Mm. So it's hard to compare because I was having the five star Indian food versus the three star equivalent in the U S. Uh, right, because yeah, when we get Indian food, it's just like regular restaurant. We but, don't go to the five star Indian restaurant. So that really good Indian place we always used to go to in uh, Fishkill, right? Mm. Uh, the meat was a thousand times more tender than that. Yeah, I bet they just probably, like, since it's a five-star restaurant, though, and it's in India, they probably just, like, you know, they got that tandoori rock. They in, really like, care about the chicken, seven. though. When I was in Hyderabad, there were so many, like, stalls, like a shop, that was like, look at our chickens. We take awesome care of them. Check them out. Here's some of them. Here's why our eggs are so great. Here's videos of how we take care of our chickens. Like, eggs are a big goddamn deal. Well, with so many vegetarians and such, right? Oh, you so know, it's and, cool. And you the know, culture there. So it's like, if it, you're going to eat meat, it, you know, people are only, you know, a lot of people probably won't eat the meat unless it's, like, the awesome so so in America, right, it's like smoking or not is like the question you get in, I guess, backwater shitty places in the U.S. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that's gone in modern places like New York. Yep. But that question, that equivalent in India is basically veg or non-veg. Mm. They'll, so everything you get from fast food everywhere, like McDonald's there, has veg and non-veg options for everything. Mm. KFC has a ha- half the menu is vegetarian. Mm. And actually, KFC there is pretty good. <laughs> Wait, what is KFC vegetarian menu? They don't have any vegetables. Potato? Yeah, so KFC there does because it's just potato and potato. I mean, what else do they have? They have other vegetables, like a whole bunch. <laughs> you can get like green beans. Oh, beans and potatoes, great. Uh, Scott, you've eaten Indian food, right? Yeah. There's vegetables in that shit. But this is KFC. What does KFC have? The that's same only veg- vegetables that Indian food has, prepared in various different ways. I want to see the menu. They have like veggie sandwiches and things. But <laughs> what? It's like I, I was at the airport, like I was really hungry, so I got like a Domino's pizza because I was in a hurry. They actually had Domino's there. So huh? the pizza options are great. It was veg pizza, non-veg pizza, spicy pizza, or spicy veg pizza, spicy non-veg pizza. Those oh my god, that options. spicy veg pizza must have been so spicy, right? Uh, wasn't that spicy? Oh yeah, that's what you ordered. 
But that was the spiciest thing I ate because I didn't end up going to a restaurant that actually had Vindaloo. Really? Just because, you know, I was only there for a week. Mm, that's I re- a lot of days. But uh, the baseline Indian food is about as spicy as so-called spicy Indian food here. <laughs> like, I got some chicken biryani because of Hyderabad, like, the chicken biryani is supposedly, like, famous. Mm-hmm. Always get the local specialty. Oh, my God. That was the best biryani ever. Always get the local but specialty. But that biryani was way spicier than any biryani Rochester, I've ever had. You get the garbage plate. That's how it works. So I asked the coworkers. I was like, so, uh... How spicy is this? They were like, what do you mean spicy? <laughs> it's not spicy. <laughs> you want spicy? You'll <laughs> die. <laughs> what do, you, do they have like every restaurant has like a bottle of pure cap in the back? And they're just <laughs> using, a, they're just like, you know, using like a, a turkey baster and going squirting it all over the place. I mean, <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> but uh, so in a normal restaurant, I got an entire meal, like a meal that I could not finish for f- 40 rupees. When you said a thousand rupees is a 20? 40 rupees is like a dollar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the despair, basically, you can go around India on a ton of money or effectively no money. Well, see, I think this is the thing, right? It's like you look at the U.S. and everyone, you know, we're all complaining about like the disparity of, of wealth, Yeah, the gap right? between the rich and the poor in the U.S. basically doesn't exist compared to most of the well, world. Well, no, no, but it's like this gigantic disparity, but... Everyone in the U.S. has the same prices, mostly, right? It's not like poor people get cheaper, you know. Oh, uh, Scott, they do. You, th- th- here's an example. In Rochester, me and Scott Johnson were at, like, I think it was Astronomicon. Remember we used to go and, like, do events yeah. for the anime club? Yeah. So we go because no one else would fucking go and help us. I wouldn't you, go. Yeah, why, I know. Why would I go? So we, we were really hungry. And remember, I was kind of poor. And Scott didn't have a lot of money on him at the time either. So we're walking around, and we see this little place like a hole in the wall, like restaurant in quotes. So we go in and for 80 cents, I, we could get like a sausage, egg and cheese and like hash browns and toast and stuff. Where was this? Yeah. So Scott, there's places like that in America. You just, you forget cause you're in New York. <laughs> there are places in the Bronx where you can get an entire meal for like two bucks. Right, but the thing is, it's like, you know, Walmart is pretty much as low as it goes, right? Yeah, you can get it. Scott, I think you forget how cheap some food is just because. You, but like rich people also go to Walmart or Amazon or whatever. They, yeah, they have know. they have options. They can go really cheap or really expensive. Yeah. Anyway. But I mean, the difference, but I mean, like those prices are ludicrously low, right? Like 80 cents for the bacon, egg and cheese versus like, you're talking like one cent. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. So the interesting thing is I had thousand rupee notes, which I'd use multiple of when I bought stuff in like the fancy parts of town and people like literally would not have changed for that for anything I might buy in other parts of town. Mm. So every denomination, a one rupee coin is actually directly useful. And there are things you can buy for one rupee. Every denom, every like scale of the money from the, from one to a thousand is directly useful all over the place. Wow. So and one rupee is the lowest, right? Like they, I would they don't tip, have pennies. I, like it's some just people one rupee, I would right? tip like five or ten rupees and I would buy like snacks and drinks for like twenty rupees. But then I'd have a dinner for like seven thousand rupees. Okay. It's like Link. I actually have uh, Do you have any big shields? I actually have about 10,000 rupees with me because I didn't change it back yet. Well, you can just change it over like any place. Well, I'm Grand waiting because the rupee is actually pretty low right now. So I'm uh, oh, going to so hold you know, out. You're, you're holding your weight. You're playing the market. I'm playing the market. You're waiting for the 10,000 rupees Partly to be worth more. Partly because I'll probably can... go back to India in May or June. Oh, okay. That's which fine. Which apparently is the hot season. It was like 95 degrees there while I was there. Oh, baby. And that's the cold season. Did you see any bicycles that weren't motorized? Uh, yes. I saw a lot of mountain bikes. Okay. I saw one guy on like a road bike, but everyone was riding like mountain bikes. Mm-hmm. But the Lance Armstrong. Well, everyone India. who was biking, pretty much everyone was riding motorcycles or Vespas or scooters or things like that, or little tuk tuk, uh, like pseudo motorcycle cabs. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, Mumbai was awesome. Like walking around, though. What's interesting is if you go to the districts where foreigners might go. Like, in Hyderabad, we went to, like, a whole bunch of, like, I saw Golconda, which is this ancient, like, uh, 14th century, 13th century fortified city that is in ruins. Nice. It was I actually... Like the, you know, I like the old shit. Yeah, I got a ton of pictures of that. And two of my awesome coworkers, like, took me around, and they were, like, explaining stuff. We went to all these temples. We, we did the, the touristy stuff. But because they're locals, like, they knew what the worthwhile touristy stuff versus the stuff that's not worth bothering to see. So I got a really good, like, and they were explaining stuff, and... What was interesting is in when I was walking around like a shanty town, nobody bothered me at all. 
Like I wandered into what the average American would probably fear for their lives, but really everyone was just kind of chill, living their lives in there. Yeah. But no one bothered me. But in the tourist areas where foreigners might go, it's kind of sad, but I literally, there were beggars like clawing at my clothes and like grabbing me and like demanding money and like putting their hands in my pockets and just like they were pickpockets and it was, it was crazy. And th- basically my two friends, the coworkers followed me around and were like at one point pushing beggars away from me and like shouting people away, like leave him alone. He's not going to give you any money or we're not going to let you rip him off. <laughs> In Hindi, like they're just yelling at these people, like keep them away from me. And it was, it was an interesting experience, but it was kind of like scarily stereotypical. Like it's, it's the kind of thing I didn't really expect to happen, and yet it actually happened exactly like it does in the movies. Yep. But I got to see like the Gate of India. You should watch the Galaxy, the Relevant Galaxy Express yeah. episode. Or the, uh, the the train station in Mumbai is like from the Relevant the, Galaxy Express episode from the colonial times. <laughs> it is. Opulent, like it is as beautiful as Grand Central, but in a very different way. Well, the it, British made it, right? It is it an amazing <laughs> building. It, you know, like extra amazing. But in the touristy areas too, and I actually have no problem with this. Like a museum I went to, right? It was five rupees for anyone who was an Indian, a Pakistani, and there's like a list of other countries. Really? Even a Pakistani? They yeah. I thought they hated them. No, actually, the average people don't care at all. They really wish, like, they're actually really chill about the Muslims. Mm-hmm. There's a huge Muslim community in India. Mm-hmm. I know that. Yeah. But, like, that slum, like the, like, the one slum that I saw that the cabbie was talking about, two million people live in that slum, and apparently it's, like, 99% Muslim. Okay. But, uh... But, like, that, that number of rupees to get into the museum, that's, like, it might as well be free. So, it's, like, it's, it's like a penny. five... 100 rupees for anyone else. So that's still almost no money. Yeah, so I paid 10 bucks to get in, and a poor Indian or a normal Indian can pay 5 rupees to get in. It's the same as the New York museums. I go in for free. Well, I go in for a penny. One penny. Yeah, one penny. You know that guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, the tourists basically pay the tourist tax. I'm okay paying the tourist tax. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, if I'm in New York and I want to go to the museum, I pay one penny. If I go to some other place and it's not free museum day... I pay the suggested donation, whatever, because I'm not paying for it with taxes. Yeah. Right? It's not, you know, it's not like, unless it's a federal museum like Smithsonian, then I'm not paying, I'm paying the minimum. Yep. <laughs> but like the ruined city was really, really interesting, partly because it wasn't curated in the same way. It's kind of like how everyone says if you want to see Greek ruins, go to Turkey. Mm-hmm. Because in Greece, they're curated differently and or, you know, the city is kind of built up around They didn't have like little description plates on them? No, nope, like it was the just, it was just here's a gigantic old ruined city fort. Uh, wander around. Check it out. There aren't like ropes preventing you from touching nope. shit. Or nope. It's and, not like don't sit here. And, nope. And uh, I hate to say it. But doesn't can, that make people ruin it? No. With their people, touching? No, nah, well, it kind of does. It's getting more ruined as time goes on. Of course. But it was actually really cool. Like we just kind of wandered around it and like poked into these buildings. Yeah, it's always it's you know it's always like a tough trade off. It's like you want to preserve this really old thing so more people can enjoy it. But you could also give up some of its preservation to have the people who are enjoying it now enjoy it more. I think you have to have a balance. You know, it's like you know, and it seems like you know we got two extremes. But it's like, well, what can you do that would be a balance? It's like, well, some museums in the U.S. were like, okay, don't touch anything. Here's one spot we want to let you touch. And it's like, uh, yeah. Of course, that thing gets touched to death. And exactly, because you get all the touching is concentrated in one. No area, touching, no touching. Right? It's like instead of having the the touching spread out over the whole thing, you concentrate in just one area, completely destroying that area, a hundred percent, way faster than any of the other areas. So apparently, Golconda though is this huge, like fortified city with a big wall around it. Then another I'm sure wall. it has the Wikipedia page. Yeah, but it, the, the neat things about it were it had this system where you could say things or clap like way down at the gates. And you'd hear it all the way up at the top in the throne room. Whoa. So they could warn, like, hey, shit's going down. Go hide. Whoa. Yeah, like, really so did stuff you like, like did that. Like, did you go to the throne room and one of your friends stayed at the front and you played a little game? Uh, I just went up there and listened to people doing stuff down there. We didn't actually play the game. <sighs> because otherwise there were people who were trying to grab us and give a free, like, give a tour. Like, hey, I'll show you around. And then at the end they were going to demand money and mm. make a big scene. Yep. So we had to avoid those people like the plague. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and also there was a tunnel. It's gone now. Like it collapsed, I think, 100 years ago. Too between Golconda and Hyderabad, the city itself. And apparently. So you could escape? Yeah, the rulers would live in the city. But if shit went down, they'd escape into the tunnel and hide in the fortress. Oh, so they didn't live in the fortress? No, they'd live in the city. It sucks to live in a fortress. Unless shit went down. Oh. 
Not bad. Yeah, there's a lot of neat stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, uh, I think I'm gonna kind of cut this short because we've actually gone on a long time. I'll talk about, I'll, I'll share other anecdotes whenever I have time on Geek Nights because I haven't even really talked about like 90 percent of what went on in India. It was only there for a week. Yeah, and I, it was, uh, I did so much in that week that I'm still struggling to like tell the whole story. Uh-huh. And I might get to go to Turkey and Germany like right after PAX. I gotta go places. See, you're you're. It's like I need vacation so I can go places. Scott, I want I want to go places real bad. But you don't have any vacation, but you're just getting business trips. That's cheating. Yeah. So Scott, you want to come with me? How can I come with you? So you have to hire me or something. Yeah. You want to work for my company? No. Why not? All right. If my only job is to travel. Yes, yeah, Scott. Your yes, job. Your stop. Your official, job. Official official traveler. Your job is gonna be writing Java code. My job will be the uh, the carrier of the corporate card. I'll be the wallet. I'll just you Scott, know. Scott, you're gonna of... be writing complex interfaces in Java. No, I won't. I don't want to do that. But then you'll get to go to Java. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that either. I, want, I just want to go to Java <laughs> without writing any Java. <laughs> Pax is coming. Yeah, going there. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.